Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, boys and girls, there is more than meets the eye because these robots are in disguise. And guess what? If you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because let's face it, you're listening right now. And if you are, hit that subscribe button. Give us the old five-star rating, the like on your podcast provider of choice. We're available pretty much everywhere. We're over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, and plus we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on the Facebook, we're on the Twitter, we're on the Instagram, we're on the Letterboxd, uh, we're on the TikTok, and I even think we're on the Tumblr for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I do dare say most importantly, Please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, television, basically the moving image at large, because guess what? If we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we'd love it even more when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please, pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a big one. We got a fun one. Uh, It's because uh, the newest Transformers movie, Rise of the Beasts, is now available on premium video on demand platforms. You may have noticed we're giving away some Apple codes, so if you want to go enter, please do that. But uh, in celebration of this momentous event and this fantastic movie, which uh, I really felt this uh, this installment of the franchise, starting to bring a little bit of the joie de vivre back to the franchise. Uh, some of those later installments got a little too serious and a little too self-involved with the spectacle building and the, and the destruction and the and just, you know, seeing everything going on. This this had a little bit more fun to it, which uh, I think definitely plays very, very well, no matter what screen you watch it on. But, in it, like I said, in celebration of this, we had the pleasure of sitting down and talking with renowned uh, producer of the film, the franchise, and so many other things, the one and only Lorenzo de Bonaventura, uh, to ask... Uh, just sort of the evolution of the franchise because he's been uh, he's been working on these uh, films since the first one back in uh, 07 I want to say uh, and he has done so very much more we asked about sort of the nature of the blockbuster and I mean even making sort of fun action movies on a budget as well which is one of those things that tends to sort of go by the wayside in modern Hollywood these days but he was a very very interesting talk and definitely one of the producers out there who's doing you know fun popcorn driven cinema which uh, as you boys and girls know well enough, uh, we love dearly. But uh, go check out Transformers Rise of the Beasts, if you haven't already. Like I said, it's available on premium video on-demand platforms now, and it's still playing in a few theaters. But uh, first, check out our talk with producer Lorenzo de Bonaventura, because uh, quite frankly, it's a darn good one. Lorenzo, obviously, first off, man, just thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate this. Pleasure. Pleasure. It's an easy movie to talk about. <laughs> well, the, again, I mean, it's, I love the film, man. I mean, it is so much fun. And I mean, I think the thing that really stood out for me, like as much as I've enjoyed all the previous iterations with Bumblebee and now with this, it really feels like sort of the lighter moments are being sort of highlighted a bit more. I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how important was it to try to, I guess, maybe shift the franchise a little bit to sort of, allow for some of those lighter moments to come out that maybe hadn't been in previous films. I I think unbeknownst to us, as we were making the movies, the first Transformers movie, I think has a lot in common with this last movie, actually, in terms of tone, in terms of fun, in terms of that stuff. And as we made more of them, I think we got a little bit caught up in the plot. Um, and so when we did Bumblebee, what was the great reaction we got from it was the emotionality was what stood out for the audience. And, we were applauded for it. And frankly, we make these movies for fans. So if they're liking it, we're happy, you know, that we're making them happy. But the only complaint about Bumblebee was not enough action. So uh, this movie, we set out to say, all right, how do we keep the emotionality, but also bring in the scale of action? And that was our sort of two pillars of, of the of the of the house, if you would, that we're trying to build. And I mean, it's such a unique franchise because, I mean, honestly, there's obviously such nostalgia attached to it as well. But 
again, just sort of how the stories are developing and how everything is sort of evolving. I love the fact that this film brought in sort of a fresh slate of new, you know, human characters, as it were. Like, how yeah. big was that for you guys to really try to give this a, a broader sense of the world rather than trying to sort of rewind it back with some of the more familiar faces? I think what's in, in a way our obligation is to give the audience something new each time and hopefully a lot new, but also uh, underscore either the nostalgic feeling or the what just period what you like about it. You know what I mean? So it's it's that balance between like we got to do enough that is a, has a familiarity so you understand this is this is the thing I love, and then bringing in these new elements that surprise you hopefully you know uh and so you know thankfully everybody um it worked out our choices of bringing the beasts and bringing in new characters uh it also for us you know honestly it's it's the it was the seventh movie we've made and right. uh, you know we want to be interested too in what we're doing and we don't want to do the same thing so it's it's fun when you come up with something like that no absolutely and i mean it's one of those things that when watching it it made me sort of go back to your credit list and sort of really appreciate a lot of the stuff you've done because at least from my perspective so many of the films you've worked on have managed to have that sense of spectacle and grandeur but also emotionality, levity, and fun. I mean, I'm kind of curious, from you as on the producing side of things, how do you try to balance those elements? Because, I mean, obviously, we can we can go, it can go one way or another, yeah. but, I mean, I find when something's right in that sweet spot of, like, spectacle, but also honest, yeah. it, it makes for something special. Well, it's interesting, because I think each, each project, you know, like a movie like Salt, for instance, hmm. there's a seriousness to that subject matter that doesn't allow a lot of levity. But, you know, you try to, what you still try to do is put an, a, an amount of humanity, if you would, of character and emotion that you're surprised to find in that kind of storytelling, if you would, you know. I'm attracted to complexity. It's what I want from the movie. Uh, and, and uh, Not complexity is not the right word. The ingredients I want from a movie is I want emotional connection and I want to be wowed and I want a pace to it if I can figure out how to keep it going, you know? Um, and so, but the process in making it, it's always readjusting itself as you're going along. This movie got funnier and funnier as we made it. Mm. Also in post. Just, it did. We must have had the DNA set because we allowed us to go that way. But I think in a way that's what, what uh, Transformers has the surprise of Transformers in the first movie was you can have robots and you can have fun, right? It's not just smash, smash, smash. And Oh my God. Um, and so that's part of the franchise. And that's part of what I, before I get involved in a movie, I asked myself, frankly, what did I want to see when I was 17, 18, not 12 or 13, uh, 17, 18, where I'm cognitively going, what is it that entertains me? As sure. Just reacting. Now, I mean, something I'm also curious about on your end, because as much as you've done these fantastic Transformers, G.I. Joe, all these big, grand sort of nine, let's face it, nine figure budget films. You've also worked on a lot of other fantastic action movies that have not had those big numbers. I'm kind of yeah. curious. Where do you like what's more of the challenge when you have more to spend or when you have limited resources? Because I mean, I can imagine it kind of it's pros and cons on both ends. I think the answer is every movie doesn't have enough money. That's just the <laughs> it's, whether it's whether it's 100 million or 200 million or 5 million, it never has enough. It's just funny. It's just that is the nature of the game. Um, it definitely restricts you with less money. You don't get me wrong, but. I don't know. Did you see the plane come out? Yes, come out it? loved it. Okay, so the plane is a modestly budgeted movie. Um, I love those kinds of movies. I, I, you know, some people look at them pejoratively as as kind of meat and potatoes, but I'm like, I like meat and potatoes. So what do you want me to say? Um, you know, I it's a good example of I want a character, and this is what we did with Anthony Ramos, and you know, I want a character that I can get behind and watch them achieve something that they didn't think was possible at the beginning of the movie, right? You never would have, Jerry Butler's character wouldn't have thought that and Anthony Ramos's character wouldn't have thought that. And I think that's when you look at my work in general, Neo and Matrix, yeah. um, you know, you're picking care. I'm always interested in that sort of like, can that, I don't say underdog because sometimes it's underdog, sometimes it's not. Um, it's can that character rise to the occasion? And can you identify with that fact? 
Hey, you know what? That makes so much sense hearing you say that because personal favorite of mine of yours is Man on the Ledge. And I mean, it's <laughs> it's such a simple premise, yeah. but I mean, by the end of the movie, man, I am cheering Sam on from like every twist and turn that goes on. It's one of those things where uh, you can have the action and you can have the emotionality, but still sort of a lot like within budget restrictions at the same time. It's not going to be one of those movies that's going to blow you away with special effects. And I mean, I'm kind of yeah. curious. When it yeah. comes to something like Transformers, how do you balance the desire for spectacle and wanting to sort of have buildings blow up and have the Autobots fight yeah. and everyone have this sort of fantastic yeah. stuff going on, but still keep the the core emotionality of it all? I, I, I would say, first of all, I'm a fan of CGI when it's done properly. And mm. I what I really reject is how many films don't do it properly. And that's my personal opinion. One of the reasons that I believe we do it really well is we shoot as much possible as possible practically yeah. so that, so that if, if you have a robot, which is a CGI thing, the background is real, not another CGI thing. So to me, what's interesting about that decision is that's cheaper doing it that way than that way. So, um, you know, that's how you balance it to some degree is how much you got to spend. And the other is, there is a reality of the budget and it does, you always bang up against it and you go past it and then you find your way to get back down. And it's, a, it's a long bruising fight actually. Um, but also, you know, like any, like any other audience member, I'm the same. It's you get action fatigue. It's, it's a really tricky thing of what is enough mm. and what isn't enough or too much, you know, and you can't know that going in. Um, so that's again, a process of learning as you go along the way, you know, mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, for me, I, I try to keep you with the human characters as it's going on, even in that big battle at the end of this movie, you know, you're pretty much keeping in mind of what Noah and Elena are doing, you know, you get, sure. you do go to the others, but they're the, they're the emotional connection and they're not CG. No, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, I mean, I got to ask, what got you into this business? Because, I mean, I'm just so fascinated because, again, you can't go take a university course on how to produce sort of these big blockbuster films. You know what it was? It was I found everything else boring. <laughs> it's true. I tried a lot of things. I didn't come to Hollywood till I was 30. I, I was in a lot of different businesses beforehand and I kept in. I was having an existential crisis. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. And I, it doesn't seem to be working. And I finally, at about 28, 29, I really was like, I better figure out this because this is getting scary. Um, and I stopped and said to myself, what is it that I love? And the answer was, I was the guy who would watch television until four in the morning on WPIX in, in New York and watched, you know, 1940s and 30s movies. And I love movies. So I was I literally rolled the dice and moved to Hollywood, not knowing anybody. Love it. Now, just last question, because obviously in this film, without giving anything away, yes. there are worlds colliding. Yes. Now, I'm just kind of curious. I'm not going to ask for spoilers or anything. Uh, okay. green Go ahead. Like I, that. I don't have to dodge it and give you the same answer. Is there a plan? Is it just a tease for the sake of a tease or is there a plan? Yeah. No, it's sort of in the middle. OK. Um, the answer is. We don't yet know the plot of the next movie because we what we do differently than a lot of franchises, we purposely do not plan the next movie until we watch the movie with the audience. Because a good example of it is if we had planned ahead, we probably would not have had Mirage, I'll say for certain, in the sequel. Now right. you have to put Mirage in, right? So that that's sort of our driving philosophy. I know a lot of people ask the question, like, is this a crossover movie? I, I, I find a different definition to that. Here's what it is. Each of these movies are a group of our humans and robots get together and stop the bad guy. I'm going to like really reductive, right? Yeah. This next group of, of people are going to have a Joe or two character, maybe three. I don't know, but they will be part of this. We're not going into the Joe world. They're coming into our world and going forward with our characters. I love it. Can't wait for the next one, sir. My friend, keep up the good work and thank you so much for the time today. Pleasure. 
And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs> 